So I'm Michael Spector. I work for The New Yorker. Uh, welcome to, uh, I think, the last of uh, quite a few conversations about genetics and the future of our planet. Um, we have really talented and amazing people here. And um, we're going to talk about, we're get, you're going to get some data that's very surprising and interesting. And then we're going to have a couple panels talking about the possibilities and consequences of using some of these technologies and a panel that will try to figure out how scientists maybe can communicate this to people in a way that is suitable for them and for science. I, I want to do a weird thing. I'm just going to read something to you, and I want you to think about it during the course of this day. I will tell you who wrote it at the end. If you think that big government interferes in your life now, just wait till the government starts regulating the genetic constitution of your children. Such regulation will inevitably follow the introduction of genetically engineering of human beings because the consequences of unregulated genetic engineering would be disastrous. Even if the code of ethics were chosen on a completely democratic basis, the majority would be imposing their own values on any minorities who might have a different idea of what constituted an ethical use of gen and genetic engineering. The only code of ethics that would truly protect, protect freedom would be one that prohibited any genetic engineering of human beings. And you can be sure that no such code will ever be applied in a technological society. Keep that in mind. I want to introduce Lee Rainey from, are you Lee? Oh, he's from the Pew Research Center and he's going to give some data about these complicated and interesting issues Thanks, that we Michael. can mull. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's an honor to be here. Uh, for a couple of years, we at the Pew Research Center have been studying science and society, particularly because we've watched the building emphasis of science issues becoming civic issues and public understanding about them, public embrace of them, public rejection of them is a big part of our culture now. And the big story that we have learned uh, in a series of studies is that there is a sort of mixed message coming from the public uh, when they think about science. At the grandest, dare I say, most cosmic level, uh, public is quite affirming of science and scientists. It thinks their contribution to the world is great, to the economy is great, and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, when you get down to more naughty issues related to uh, hot button political and scientific issues, or just stuff that people have a much more direct experience of, they're more skeptical, more wary, and less trusting of scientists. So this is an environment that's quite challenging in the broadest sense for science issues, but it's particularly challenging on the topics that we're discussing today. So the, the, again, the grand meta story when we ask people about science and, their, and the contribution of scientists to society, most people think it's a good one. That, and this number, 67% uh, saying it's mostly positive, is interesting in its diversity. Better educated people are slightly more likely to say science has made a greater contribution. Uh, younger people are slightly more likely. But it's a broad judgment that applies to Republicans and Democrats, well-to-do people and less well-to-do people, highly educated uh, folks, and, and even less educated folks are very comfortable embracing this broad idea. And they have high hopes for science. We've just marched them through a series of questions about what might happen in the next 50 years, and they feel pretty good about things. So they're 81 percent say in the next 50 years it's likely to happen that uh, we will routinely transplant artificially made organs in humans. 66 percent say we will cure most forms of cancer. Uh, 54 percent say we will have computer chips routinely embedded uh, in our bodies. There will be monitors in our bodies. And even on this particular issue, there's sort of a split verdict about eliminating birth defects. But it's, it's, a, it's basically a tie. About half the public is expecting now that this will be a reality of life in the next 50 years. Some of the things they don't think will happen include teleportation. They're not sure scientists are going to crack the code uh, for that one. And they're not sure we're going to colonize other planets uh, in the next 50 years. But generally speaking, there are high hopes uh, in the broad public for what scientists can do. 
These are numbers that have been gen generated by the General Social Survey, which is an enormously important set of social science findings that have extended over a couple of generations now. And you'll see that both the broad scientific community, as well as the medical community in particular, ha their reputation has held up pretty well over this span. And if you would add the numbers here of people who said not only they have great expectations and great confidence in scientists, but they have fairly good expectations, these numbers would bump up to the 60s and 70s of people who generally feel good about scientists. Now, it's, a, it's an amazing story because almost every other profession and almost every other institution has seen a decline in trust, sometimes a catastrophically steep decline in trust in the last generation. So the fact that scientists have held their own and are still in the public imagination standing where they were uh, a generation ago is actually a, a, a significant uh, success story. But we, when you get down to the naughtier issues uh, in the here and now in our day-to-day -day politics and political culture, the divergence between public attitudes and the attitudes of the scientific community uh, are pretty stark. We ran people through a battery of questions in 2014. We asked them in a general population survey, uh, so representative of the entire adult population of the United States. And then we asked the same questions of a representative sample of members of the American members of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the biggest scientific community in the world. So that mostly they're scientists, but they're also fellow travelers of scientists or scientists wannabes. So it's, in a way, this is a vote of where the scientists scientific community sort of stands on some of these issues. And what we found that was so striking was that there were big gaps between what the public attitudes were on these issues and the, issue, and the way the scientific community saw these issues. So at the top of the list, scientists think that the safety of genetically modified foods is pretty clear. The public doesn't agree with that. There's a 51-point gap between where the scientific community stands and where the public stands on that issue. Similarly, the public uh, doesn't think that it's a terribly good idea for the scientific community to rely on animals for uh, testing. There's also a big gap about the safety of pesticide uh, in enabled in grown foods. The climate change is, of course, is the biggest hot button issue. And in fact, it was pretty much driving uh, the, our rationale for ramping up a lot of our science work at Pew Research because there was such a difference between what the scientific community was saying and what the public community was saying. That shows up in our data here. Of course, evolution shows up on every list through all time about differences between the scientific community and, and the public. There's also a, a difference related to nuclear power plants and, uh, interestingly, on childhood vaccines. So when we presented these findings to scientists in particular, we don't feel that, there are any, uh, that they are the only stakeholders of our work, but they clearly are important stakeholders of our work. They, they ran through a series of questions about why are, why are we on a different side of so many issues from the public? Is it that they don't trust us? Is it because of the politicization of science issues? Is it because they don't know? Often scientists believe that if the public only had better education, particularly on scientific issues, they'd come along to the scientific side. Well, it turns out when you do statistical modeling in this, a whole series of factors are going on. And there's not a one-size-fits-all explanation for why there are these gaps. So the dark blue dots here are when you find strong statistical significance independently of other factors for why people's beliefs are where they are. So the Earth is warming is a very highly partisan issue. It has a dark blue box there. But age is an independent predictor of people's attitudes. In other words, no matter um, uh, what their party ideology, young adults are significantly more likely to back the scientific point of view than their elders. But on other issues, it, the um, ideology is not very much a factor or not at all a factor. If they're not at all a factor, it's um, on the yellow boxes there. And the light blue boxes are, they're sort of, you know, it, it's statistically meaningful, but not a, a big driver of it. The whole reason to show you this slide is not to dump a whole lot of data on you. It's just to show you a pattern here so that there is not a one-size-fits-all explanation for what's going on in these differences between the public and, and the science community on these variety of issues. These relate to the two issues that are on the table today for us. Uh, one is modifying genes to reduce a baby's risk of disease. The single most powerful predictor of someone's uh, alignment with the scientific community or, or um, support for that idea was age. It was not ideology. It was not people's education level. 
level or their direct knowledge of science or stuff like that. Uh, and so there, you know, there's some enthusiasm for ideas like this uh, among the young compared with older folks. And then modifying genes to increase their baby's intelligence, there was not any really stark pattern here. There was not one big driver of public attitudes about that. There was just sort of a relatively modest level of difference uh, across the board. Now, we, asked, we marked people through a series of, of uh, exercises where we asked them about their trust in science and scientists um, on three particular hot button issues. One was uh, measles, mumps, uh, and childhood vaccinations. The second was climate change. And the third was the GM foods. And we asked them about scientists' motives. What, what did they think was, was driving um, scientific inquiry into these things? And on these issues, the public is sort of uh, unsure, uh, uh, particularly in the case of climate change and GM foods. They're not sure if scientists are simply in pursuit of the best available knowledge, or they might be driven by other incentives in the scientific inquiry process, publication rights, competition with other labs, maybe supporting the ideology of their funders or things like that. And so you can see here the public is a little bit skeptical, particularly on climate issues and GM food issues, that scientists are op operating in the sort of broadest sense of the public good. But again, sort of messy data here that, that it's hard to sort of pin one thing on. When we ask people which other stakeholders in these arguments bring the best have, have the purest motives, bring the best evidence to the table. And scientists across the board on these three issues were seen as the most reliable, most trustworthy, most consistent practitioners of sort of scientific uh, sensibilities rather than other actors. And we also asked who should be at the table when policy is made about this. Overwhelmingly, the public wants scientists there. Now, to the heart of the story we're talking about today, we march people through a, a series of, of, of questions related to three human enhancements. Uh, we asked about genetically modifying babies to um, rid them of uh, potential genetic defense, defects or the prospect of disease down the line. We asked people about implanted brain chips that might be um, able to enhance people's uh, capacity to learn things and concentrate on things. And we asked them about synthetic blood, which might, might make them a little uh, more capable of endurance and things like that. So the promise of these um, three R articles was they could be smarter, stronger and healthier. And yet, across the board in these things, when you ask about the prospect of these, the public is more wary, more worried than it is enthusiastic. And the pattern is so similar that you can't necessarily say it's just this one thing that bothers them. There's this sort of generalized sense that wariness is a default condition of lots of the public when it thinks about things that are coming out of the lab, in some cases actually in implementation now, but certainly are going to be available to folks in the not distant future. So what's going on with this? Partly it's a story um, about morality. Um, and so we asked um, uh, people who are parents of children, would you have this for your child? And behavioral economists might call this a uh, recency or a framing question because people uh, who have a minor child are much more likely to say, I would uh, think about genetic engineering of a baby to, to prevent birth defects than people who either don't have a child or have grown children. So their they're children being uh, you know, the, the disease condition or health condition of children is clearly on their mind. So that's one thing that's a difference in the population. Uh, another thing is, um, is related to their, um, their moral status or people's religious filters through which they gather this kind of information. We asked whether you, you do it to your babies to reduce, reduce the risk and whether that was a, a, mor a morally good or bad thing. In the general population, there was a split verdict. 28% said it was morally acceptable. 30% said it was not. That's not statistically meaningful. And interestingly enough, in those gray boxes, there were a lot of people who just didn't want to answer this question, didn't know what their foundational moral ideas would be or how to apply them to this. But we saw that for religious people, and you can measure religiosity in any number of ways, and we broke down people into whether they were highly religious or sort of medium religious or less religious, those that had uh, sort of religion and spirituality at the center of their lives were much less likely to say that this was a morally good choice to make to edit your baby. Uh, and uh, they would also not want it for their, um, for their own child if it came uh, to that for them. And then um, 
we also found that it literally exposure, one of the classic things in communication theory is if you know about something, you have a different feeling about it than if it's brand new introduced to you and you're asked for your opinion on it. So even a little bit of exposure to awareness about the prospect of gene editing uh, made people a little bit more likely to support it. So there's a big meta message in these data about the scientific community engaging around these issues and making sure that more people in the public are at least aware of them and some of the choices uh, that have to be made. And here was our money question. You know, we said, what's going to happen uh, both at the personal level and at the societal level if gene editing of babies comes into being? And this is where their skepticism is sort of most dramatically in evidence. 73% said the option would be uh, put into practice and made available to the public before it was fully tested and we would understand the effects. 70% said inequality will increase and will only be available to the wealthy. Now remember, we're asking these questions now when inequality in, in both wealth and income in society is a front and center issue. I think that's what's going on in a bunch of these data. And if the people who get gene editing, there was also some worry that they just feel superior uh, to other people. And, and people's you know, respect for others and, and, and connection to others is something that's going on in a lot of minds. But 52% said that, um, that people who have this will feel more confident about themselves. OK. 45% uh, said that widespread use of it would maybe lead to better problem solving and innovation. You get s smarter, healthier people out of this, and that would potentially have a societal impact. And then people would be more productive at their jobs. Interestingly enough, that showed up on each uh, of the things that we talked about, gene editing, the blood transfusions, and, uh, and the brain chips. And then finally, again, we asked the core question about whether this uh, would affect the germline or not. And people were much more comfortable with it if it were going to be applied just to particular individual babies. If it didn't cascade uh, through the generations, uh, Americans were more uh, open to the idea uh, than they would be if it were something that were affecting the gene line of the species itself. So the meta message here is Americans have a sort of love wary relationship with scientists, and um, that's the context in which the rest of this conversation will be taking place. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to talk about unintended consequences, but, but I think it's strange to do that without talking about consequences. I mean, why, why would we do any of this if we wouldn't want to have a better world, better humans, better animals, better nature, to flourish? And Drew, I'm wondering if you wanted to say a couple things about the possibility for flourishing with gene engineering. I'll try. <laughs> um, so biology exists not just in human form, but across the entire planet. It's mostly powered by photosynthesis. And if you quantify that, it turns out that it's 90 to 100 terawatts of energy being harvested in nature at any moment. So that number might not make any sense, 90 or 100 terawatts, what's that? To put it in context, all of our civilization right now is powered by about 20 terawatts of energy. So in nature, photosynthesis is harvesting about four to five times as much energy as the entirety of our civilization runs on. Um, so what's up for grabs here? What would be an unintended consequence of awesomeness? Uh, you know, if we realized operational full capacities in terms of partnering with living matter to make stuff, you could imagine re-implementing how we manufacture uh, most of everything, uh, a la what Ginkgo and others are doing, and do so in a way that's partnered much more smartly with the rest of the living world. I'll give you one parochial example in Menlo Park. Um, we have garden clippings. It turns out, on average, it's about 500 pounds of garden clippings per person per year. In a town of 32,000 people, that's 16 million pounds of matter, state-of-the-art natural nanotechnology compiled from the atmosphere every year, and what do we do with this fabulous stuff? You know, these, a leaf is a self-assembling solar panel that recycles itself. Uh, we pay people to throw it away, and we compost it. Uh, it turns out you could take that material and feed it to a wood fungus, a mushroom, and grow things like leather. There's a very interesting company, Mycoworks, that grows a surrogate for leather in giant lasagna trays of sawdust. And within two weeks, you can make an infinite slab of leather with no mammal involved. And you peel it off, and you put it through a tanning process, and off you go. So what's at stake here from a non-human perspective is a re-implementation of how our civilization manufactures things on a capacity that seems more than enough to just have abundance. And hmm, how about we do that? And, and I mentioned this one just to transition back to the human topic. 
I can get really, 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 really excited about engineering the human germline and full-on synthesis of humanity. But for me personally, I have two preconditions I wish for. The first is to transition our civilization from living on Earth to living with Earth. And bio-based manufacturing is going to be at the heart of that. And the second is to develop a sense of the sacred in the realm of the digital, such that when I was looking at a sequence of a human genome on some fancy display in the future, and I might think about changing that letter T to an A or a G or a C, I feel the same way about that experience as I do when I'm home tomorrow with my one-year-old boy who's just learned how to walk, and I'm experiencing him as an actual physical object. That's a high level of uh, hope. Uh, when we talk about, you know, if you look at the data that was just presented to us, uh, some of it was encouraging about what scientists do, but there's definitely, it can definitely be said that people are worried about gene editing. They don't know what it is, they don't know where it's going, and they're not sure they want to know. How do we deal with that? Christina? Uh, what do you mean? Why do we have to deal with it? Well, presuming we are going to edit genes and use them in humans, if there's a group of people, a large majority of people, who are made anxious refuse by Nicks. this. The what? Refuse Nicks? Luddites? I don't know. What's the... Well, are yeah. you okay with that? Like, we'll just edit the people who want to be edited, and the other ones can just sink beneath the waves. Well, I don't want to be edited. <laughs> so uh, so I, I, basically, I guess what I'm saying is I think um, it's... It's reasonable to be skeptical uh, and to question and to challenge uh, what people are proposing for the future. I think as a scientist, that's how I've been trained uh, to, right. to constantly be challenging other people's proposals and visions and hypotheses for what it is and what should be. Um, but do you think? So I think it's reasonable. Well, to I have two be questions. Cautious. Do you think scientists are, and anyone can answer this, are scientists reaching out enough so that people understand what the possibilities are? And when you say it's reasonable to be skeptical, it's, I would go further and say it's required to be skeptical. Yeah. But do you think most people who are skeptical um, are skeptical based on knowledge or instinct? Does it matter? Yeah. Um, do you think it matters whether people are opposed to GMOs because they just feel weird about it or because they have some knowledge? Because I don't know of any knowledge that would let you be opposed to GMOs. Uh, I think, I mean, I, maybe just to be provocative, I would say it doesn't matter. Um, and that, that the, um, so and, and your first question, like, have scientists done enough to, to come out? I think we, the scientists need to go out into the world and talk not to like convince people to come to our side, but to also learn what it is that what it means to be better. Everyone is gonna want a different thing for the future. Everyone has their own visions for what they want. Um, and I think, yeah, and, and within the scientific community, I think there's also a lot of diversity in there too. Um, so I think there isn't, I, yeah, maybe, may, I'm pushing back on you because I don't think that there's like one thing that is GMO or like one kind of editing of people. <laughs> I think this is how. Um, I don't either, but I think there's one kind of lack of knowledge. I mean, there are just a lot of people who don't know what a cell is. That's not necessarily their fault, but we need to do something about that if we're going to live in a world where we're actually editing cells in humans and in other things. Sure. Yeah. I think it's great to know about cells. I spent my whole life doing it. <laughs> uh, I think uh, saying that you have to know as much as me as a precondition of having an opinion, I think is not right. I, I didn't say that. Uh, Okay. Did I say that? Well, that's what it sounded I don't like. even know how much you know. So how <laughs> did I say that? Hank, help us. Um, how do you, there's obviously a big gap to bridge between some people with knowledge and desire, and those can be different people, yeah. to do some of these, use some of these technologies aggressively. And people for many reasons, including many good reasons, who are reticent. How do we get over that hump? I think we need to, th to think a lot about governance structures and what the governance structures should look like. Ultimately, science is inevitably embedded in the societies that it works in. It can't exist without social support. It can't exist without, without the absence of social disapproval. At least it can't exist at anything like the level that it, it exists now. 
So if your country or your culture, if South Dakota votes as it did to make human embryonic stem cell research a felony, uh, you're not going to be able to do that in South Dakota. You may move someplace else. Um, but communicating with the population so that the population can make decisions about where it as a culture wants to go is going to be really important. But I think one thing we lose sight of often, at least I'm a law professor, so we lawyers often think about decisions at the governmental level. I think all these things work at two different levels. One is the social, cultural, governmental level, and the other is the personal level. Do you want to do this or not? Do you want your family to do this or not? And then on top of that, do you think your society should allow this to be done or not? Those are different questions. And for, I think people will come to better answers for them the more they know. But you know, one of the interesting things about the data that Lee presented and other data I've seen is that increasing scientific knowledge is not monotonically, is not solely associated with increasing acceptance. Right. At some point, more knowledge means more skepticism and less acceptance. So you know, having people know more is a good thing but we are going to be ultimately governed by the cultures we live in. And so it's really important for scientists and science fellow travelers to stay in touch with and try to communicate with those societies. So here's my um, governance question. I just recently came back from Mali. At some point, they would like to eradicate malaria by changing the genetics of the Anopheles mosquito. I was only there a little while. It seems like those people who've been exposed to this idea in Mali, including natural healers, a broad spectrum of people that I saw. I never saw anyone who said, no, let's not do that. That might happen. We're far from the time when that would happen. But let's say they go ahead. Mosquitoes aren't governed by legislative bodies. They're going to fly over the border whether we want them to or not. Yep, that's a really interesting and hard question in a global, it, with things that have global effects what a governance structure is going to look like is a real problem. We obviously haven't solved that in the last 60 years or the last 100 years. I think people took a hard crack at it after Hiroshima and Nagasaki in atomic weapons and how they should be controlled, and it bounced. We didn't really get any good international control over it. Some of the genetic technologies can be limited to some extent, so baby making can be jurisdictionally limited, except, of course, for what's called reproductive tourism, where if you live in a right. restrictive country or state, you just take a little vacation to the Grand Cayman Islands, and you come back uh, one week pregnant, and how's your home country ever going to know? Uh, but I think things gene drive, which I suspect Kevin Esfeld will talk about some, uh, has the potential for crossing national borders. It reminds me a lot of geoengineering as well. It's where one country, you know, if the, if the Maldive Islands made a deal with either Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos to send up ships with lots of sulfur dioxide particles, they could affect the whole world by themselves. And well, we don't and have I, good answers for those. Let things. me just interrupt. I'm sure most, if not all of you know this, but geoengineering is the purposeful uh, manipulation of the environment to protect us from the things we've already done to the world. And it's increasingly complicated and... Uh, I think important topic, and there are there are obviously people in this. I think is true in genetics, who have enough money to just do this unilaterally. Right. And so, at a certain point, if you want to edit a feature in an embryo, and the United States doesn't want that to happen, go to Singapore, go to wherever whoever does allow it to happen, and then you're starting to have a society. I don't really think we want, but I don't know how to not have that. Are you, is your proposal, though? It, it sounds I have so, no so, proposal. So, I mean, the question, when the way you posed the question at first made it sound like, how do we get people to agree that we should be editing? People? I don't have, a, I actually don't have a, a position on this. Okay. But all I do know, and I'm convinced of it, is it will happen. And so, since it will happen, we ought to figure out a way to make it fair and equitable and maybe affordable and reasonable. And I don't know how to do any of that, and I don't know any institutions. What about that. making it unfair, inequitable, and unreasonable? If we were to do the opposite, would that give us some approach or lesson that would inform? You mean and, make it super restrictive? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious that we're making, making one or two mistakes. And, and the first mistake has to do with the puzzle of biotechnology 
which is it's typically a technology of last resort. If we could cure a heritable disease with nuts and bolts you get from the hardware store, great, mm -hmm. and probably wouldn't be too controversial because we'd have a familiarity with it and a sense of it would work, and, um, and so on. Um, so when problems show up in the you know, doorstep of biotechnology, they're very pressing problems related to disease or environment. Uh, they need to be solved yesterday. Um, and, and that's been true of biotechnology since genetic engineering was invented. The concerns around recombinant DNA were immediately counterbalanced with the benefits of recombinant insulin and so on and so forth. They're very real benefits, I won't. However, when you drive a technology or any new human capacity through the lens of utility almost exclusively, the culture that develops around it is crazy. Um, there's the Dutch historian, Huizinga, who publishes in 1938 his idea about homo ludens, humans as players, as opposed to um, homo faber, humans as makers. Now, as an engineer and a tinkerer, I originally encountered biotechnology through this lens of making and utility and solving problems. But Huizinga's point is, if you don't first develop a culture of play, then you'll never have a more mature culture upon which you can have reasoned citizens, diversities of perspective, and so on and so forth. And it just seems to me we've skipped over exploring what it would mean to have a culture of play in biotechnology. Y yeah, but I don't see how we could avoid that. It's like saying to get a mature discussion about hand grenades, you have to have a culture of play with hand grenades. It's dangerous enough that I think, even though I'm, I'm generally not enormously paranoid or fearful about biotechnology, it's dangerous enough requiring a culture of play before any kind of efforts at sensible controls seems a bad noticing, idea. Well, but I can't require anything. I'm just noting I inherit the situation and it's been 40 years of utility and that's led to a whole bunch of dysfunction and dissatisfying conversations. And so I'm therefore merely suspicious that we should explore backfilling. I think we just yeah. need to separate out the, maybe the conversation about like genetic engineering biotechnology in general and editing people specifically mm -hmm. in that conversation? Maybe. I, May, I don't. Sure. You, do you think, okay, so actually, do you know Adam Zaretsky? Oh, yes. Uh, so he, uh, he's an artist, uh, bio artist, and he's, his new thing that he's been going around is like, I need more embryos that I can engineer for fun and have like a high school class, uh, like sized group of babies that will have like 13 elbows because it's weird and fun. Uh, and, I, and he's saying it as a provocation. And, and, and I think in, in some sense, yeah, this question of what, what does it mean to have fun with a human genome? What is, would it mean to engineer people for, for fun rather than profit? Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I just throw that out there to say I, there I, are people that talk. I do think Adam's a good example. People who are worried about mad scientists. You know, there aren't that many mad scientists because scientists kind of need grants and they like tenure and they want to win prizes. And there are some constraints on scientists. Artists? <laughs> Not all artists, but there are artists for whom being provocative and controversial is the highest good. There aren't very many scientists for whom that's true. So let me, I think there are some. Those provocations have different so let me, states, let me right? offer a proposal then yeah. because I, I think I agree with you. I would argue uh, that we should regulate biotechnology like we regulate Bob Dylan. Um, our, our most recent Nobel laureate in poetry. And uh, if you take a deeper view on things, it looks like what's emerging to me is a type of language and printing press for expressing mm -hmm. human intentions into living matter. Um, we've seen printing presses emerge in the past, and societies respond in different ways to the printing press. So the historical printing press we're familiar with is reacted to differently in China than in Europe. It's massively disruptive, mm -hmm. associated with the Reformation and other things. And um, yet here we are. And uh, one of the puzzles around what's happening in biotech is people have these new capacities and tools emerging, yet the frameworks and systems we have in place would like for nothing to change. Uh -huh. So the, you know, hey mom, we made the living world fully engineerable, but everything stayed the same, doesn't really make any sense. Yet that's how we're reacting and. But I agree completely, but that's why I'm saying we're not even having a conversation about how we build things in a living world. We're not having a conversation about how people might understand that or want it or not want it. Yeah. And I really don't, I do think that till we have those conversations and not just at places like this, we can't do any of that. The wrong place to start is probably the human germline. Yeah. Because it makes play really tricky. 
there have been attempts to attract attention around such projects, synthesizing a human genome with the protagonist declaring, we're doing this project to force everybody to pay attention to us. It may be more useful to try and construct a dragon and get more different types of people interested. A tiny little dragon, nothing too dangerous. <laughs> So, uh, really, this is a deep dive, right? I, I think one of the deep issues here, and it began to congeal a little better for me in the great panel you did with Drew and with Kevin Esfeld earlier today, our ideas about responsibility here have really interesting effects. So, when my wife and I had kids, we had kids, we, we did it the old-fashioned way, no gene selection, no editing, did go through amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling, so there was a bit of a check there, but not much. Um, and it's turned out well, knock on wood, so far. But it's an act of, the, the genes they got were random, were chance, we weren't really deeply responsible for it. We were responsible for deciding to have kids, but we weren't responsible for the genes they ended up with. Whereas if you do gene editing or if you do embryo selection, you are responsible for your decisions, which makes you more morally chargeable in ways, which I think in some ways makes people more reluctant. So uh, geoengineering, for example, we've been geoengineering the planet forever, ever since at least humans started using fire, but we didn't know it. We didn't think about it. We didn't, we didn't feel responsible for it because we didn't know it was happening. If you intentionally set out to do something, you incur more responsibility, more moral responsibility in a way that I think is at the root of a lot of people's concerns about going forward. It's easier to have a bad result randomly than to risk having a bad result because you made a decision. That's true, but the reason I read that little thing at the beginning of this was I think that person who wrote that has a point, which is we're gonna do gene editing one way or the other and there's gonna be a majority it can be democratic, it can be fair, it can be equitable, but there's also going to be a minority. And I don't see any way around that except not to do gene editing. And I don't actually think this particular species is very good at not doing stuff. Okay, so that then suggests there's going to be the equivalent of the Boston Tea Party. All right? So the Boston Tea Party was what? King George III was the problem, uh, approximately? So instead of dumping tea into the harbor, we're going to take bottles of phosphoramidites, the ingredients that go into the DNA synthesizer, and throw them into the harbor, and we're going to declare our liberation from Charles Darwin, right? Mutation without representation. <laughs> and let's go. And, and a, a, group of, a group of rebels will go off and do that. We need to find a state whose license plate holder will say that. Yeah. Mutation Wherever without Kevin representation. <laughs> But again, but, but, you know, it's majorities and minorities. But there are majorities and minorities already. There are people who don't drive. I'm a Californian. It's hard for me to understand them. But there are people who choose to opt out of driving. There are people who choose to opt out of eat, eating meat. There are even, I'm told, people who choose to opt out of the Internet. Do you think that's the same as if we were to foresee 30, 50 years from now choosing to opt out of a basic gene editing technique that would prevent terrible disease. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a couple examples of interesting precedents that are going on today, right? You don't have to think very far in the future. There's people who opt out of vaccinations, um, who believe that it's important for p children to get certain diseases in childhood. That's, that's just the natural way of things, right? I don't agree with them, <laughs> uh, but I'm saying that the, that group of people exists. Um, so, there's a in that example, there's an implication for other people who have not made that same choice. But what do we think um, of that group of people in general? Do we think they're um, learned people who've made a conscious decision not to vaccinate their children? Uh, who's we? And Whoever you want <laughs> we to be. Society. I, actually, I you. think empirically they often are yeah. more educated. They've made oh, a study of They're educated people, but yeah. they just yeah. it's, this, don't study This is that. such a tough line in some ways because you know, you've got parents making decisions, but they're making decisions about the child. In the vaccine in case, they're also making decisions about other people's but, children yeah. secondarily. So, on the vaccine, some states, my state, California, has gone very, very hard on limiting 
recently limiting the number of exemptions you can get or the ways you can get exemptions. Other states are broader. A lot of European countries don't mandate them at all and are facing measles and other epidemics as a result. We're mixed on that. Jehovah's Witnesses say, don't give my kid blood transfusions. The courts now almost uniformly will take custody of the children for the period during which they need the blood transfusion and then give them back. Oh, really? Yeah, so we've got a strong parents should be able to control their children up to a point. And when it becomes an issue for child protective services, it's the hard line to draw. And I think that could also happen with respect to gene editing I think that's or the, gene selection. The other example, I mean, yeah, first, so embryo other? selection uh -huh. is already happening, right? And so uh, our, uh, embryo selection and selective abortions. For, so like the population of people with Down syndrome is much lower today than it was historically when we weren't able to do that. Um, and that implies something about the people who are living with Down syndrome, uh, right? And people who have people with disabilities of all kinds. Right? If we're talking about editing those things out, um, people in those communities themselves like say, like, I deserve to live, <laughs> right? And, and that imp has an implication about those people alive today. So when we're talking about unintended consequences, right? we can speculate about what's going to happen in the future, but there's uh, implications for like, actual people living today who have Down syndrome or are deaf or all, have all sorts of disabilities. Um, but and that are that are want to kind of claim space for themselves, and then you're saying, oh, we should just edit that out. It's inevitable. I'm not <laughs> saying any of these things. Yeah. I'm saying it's impossible not to discuss this, and I don't think we are discussing it. We and are. And I also think when we talk about people choosing, and we're talking about gene editing, it's not about even just people alive today. It's people alive in 11 generations. I mean, if you decide to edit your embryo in a certain way, that has an effect on the future. Yeah, there's any? a there's Absolutely. a conceit in that last point oh, with you the, made, I, yeah, go right, ahead. which has to do with the presumption that the technologies of 11 generations from now will look at all like what we're talking about today, and I think this dominates the CRISPR conversations in many forms. It just isn't likely to be the case that uh, by the end of the century, even not 11 generations, but a few generations from now, we're going to be editing and relying on that only. Because so, you think we'll be printing or other things, but certainly what other things? How would I know? Well, so even like imagine, and so uh, Bruce Sterling has a really good uh, essay about this question. Like, okay, imagine you are the first super baby and like what it would be like to be super baby 1.0, right? And, you, and everyone's got these really high expectations on you. <laughs> Already like, you know, people in my generation and younger have like a terrible anxiety because horrible <laughs> expectations put on them by their parents. Uh, but the, uh, <laughs> It, but imagine now you're like 20, you've, you're in college, you're like coming of age, you're finally uh, achieving your promise as a super baby, but super baby 26.0 just came out and is way better than you. Uh, <laughs> and, Welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, anyway, so like that, that sort of like, th that story was kind of to imply that like it would just suck to be engineered. And so like as much as we, the parents, might want to do that because, oh, it'll give them a leg up and whatever, that like they'll, maybe they'll, the revolt will actually come from the <laughs> engineered. You know, Wait, before you say anything, is there anyone who works here who can tell me when this panel ends? Because I know we're on a four time, minutes. and I don't Three, know what the time is. Oh, that's a clock. OK. And that's for our I, section. Um, All right. I, I also want to say, too, I, I, I think a lot of the, like, there's another consequence that, and, and I tried to bring it up in, in your last panel, uh, of, of this, these kinds of conversations in general. Because I think that underlying a lot of it is this idea that we will engineer people, and they will be smarter and more beautiful and, uh, and shorter. <laughs> athletic and shorter. And, shorter. And, sm and smell better. And smell better. Smell better we can do with bacteria, and that you just clean right off. Um, that is her department. Uh, that's my thing. Uh, but, the, uh, but I think that that, like, again, like the same way that there are implications for people who are with disabilities alive today, I think the more we assume that it's going to be possible to just like type a genome and a smart person will come out, uh, <laughs> that intelligence is inborn and, and like defined in our genes at birth. And when that is the, the case, like there are studies where uh, they have students read, uh, piece, like read a document that says uh, intelligence is inborn and defined at birth and then have them do math tests. Um, and women and underrepresented minorities uh, do worse on the math test um, than students who read a piece of paper that says math and uh, intelligence and math ability are learned and not inborn. Well, wait. So like people actually do worse in, in school 
if they just believe okay, that intelligence is... Okay, why would that be different if people are printed? I mean, right now you would agree there's I'm inequality. Saying, yeah. Why would there not be the same sort of inequality in the future? I'm saying the, the, the fact that we are even having this conversation perpetuates that idea. Do you think this conversation that we'll get further by not having this conversation? No, we have to have a better conversation. Let's which, have that. <laughs> which, which is that, we like, what, what are, what is it possible? Like, what is in our genes and what is not? I think it's so easy for us to say, oh, our DNA defines us. It is us. It, this is Well, me. I don't think there's anybody uh, on this di dais who believes that. But, yeah. the, but, like, there are advertisements on television that say, okay, this is we, your DNA. This is you. Like, you can uh, buy kits yes, that will tell you that. Yes, but we work uh, for that particular company. I so mean, I'm, but I'm you're saying, acting like we endorse that. I think, we don't. I think we are complicit uh, in, in those conversations. So can I offer yeah. um, an example of a different type of unintended consequence from mm -hmm. another technology? Some decades ago in Colorado, in Boulder, um, people got really good at measuring time and the second, and were able to measure the second mm -hmm. to within one nanosecond, one billionth of a second. And they've gotten about a billion times better since then, but a number of decades ago, they, that's how good they got. What was the unintended consequence of that? Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> GPS satellites, personal phones, proximity detection based on precision measurements of time, and all of a sudden, an augmented reality experience where people are hunting virtual creatures by walking around. <laughs> so if we got really good at engineering our germline, you would have to anticipate, without knowing what it could be, that there's going to be some not necessarily negative consequences, but just weird, different, sideways things that become possible. Yeah. So 30 seconds on 11 generations. We're all the product of 11 choices made 11 generations ago. Uh, five or six generations ago, some of my ancestors decided to come to the US. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here literally and figuratively. But also, 11 generations from now, those people will be influenced by what we do, but it's going to be their world. And we shouldn't try to determine what their decisions and answers were going to be. We should let them, we, we won't have any choice ultimately, but that's their world and their decisions to make and not ours. OK, what, we have to change, but I'd like to end this very interesting panel with the question, should we even, do we have a responsibility to try and figure out a right or wrong thing to do for any generation other than our own? Don't answer. Think about it. Come back. That's the end of this panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Now we're going to talk more about this very similar thing. So Kevin Esfeldt runs the Sculpting Evolution Lab at the MIT Media Lab, and he's coming. Nina Faraday is a professor of philosophy and law at Duke University. And Alondra Nelson is professor of sociology at Columbia. And we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about what could be done, or what needs to be done, or what is or isn't done to communicate these complicated issues to people so that they participate. And I'll start with you, Kevin, because Kevin is doing some work with um, white mice on Martha's Vineyard to make them resistant to Lyme disease. And you've gone several times, I mean, I'm sorry, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, but you've gone several times. <laughs> I don't want to get anyone from Nantucket upset. Um, and you've been very pointed about saying, this is the sort of scientific possibility. This is for you to decide. Because in the end, maybe it's that is the more important thing than the science. How, how is that going? Well, first of all, when you go to people and say, we haven't done any experiments yet. We haven't raised any funding to do this yet. Because our idea is to solve ecological problems using biology. Many of you have ideas about what we should and should not do to manipulate biology. But from our perspective, we think we might be able to help with a, with a problem that is local here, but it would involve altering the shared environment. And we don't want to bother unless you're at least interested. And if you are interested, because it's your environment, you need to make the key decisions. That is, there are going to be different technological options, and there may even be more that become available as the project proceeds if you are interested. And you need to make those decisions, because it's your environment and not ours. What we can say is we will be your technical hands. We will work to make it happen if you are interested. But it has to be on you. 
ultimately, we may enable you. And that, in that sense, the responsibility is ours. But it's your environment, and you have to decide, do you want to change it to solve this problem or not? And the community said, largely, this is a severe problem we have, tick-borne disease. It's, it's a tremendous problem. The chair of the Board of Health on Nantucket said that 40% of households have been impacted. The rates are astounding. It's one of the most common infectious diseases in the United States. And the rates of other non-Lyme tick-borne diseases are also increasing. And it's because we already engineered the environment. We allowed the deer population to explode, which means there's lots of ticks. We love woods, but we love carving them up with subdivisions and roads and houses, which means lots of wooded edges, which favors the mice. The mice are the best reservoir of all these diseases. The ticks are the transmit it from the mice to us and from mice to other mice, maintaining it. So we created a perfect storm for these diseases. We could immunize the mice any number of different ways against ticks, against Lyme, against the other pathogens, and we could do any of those. And the people said, yes, we're interested. We want everything to be done in the open. We want our elected representatives to have a say in who oversees the project. And we want veto power at any point where we can say no. And that's exactly as it should be. So now, all six towns on the vineyard and the town of Nantucket have appointed members elected by their boards of health to steering committees that are in charge of the project. And, well, they have a bit of a rivalry between the islands, so they have to have two different steering committees. But so far, they agree on what should be done, which is, if we're going to do this at all, by all means, engineer the mice to resist both tick bites and Lyme disease, but don't use any non-mouse DNA, which is something that we can do. Now, if any of you happen to live on the East Coast, but not on Nantucket or the Vineyard, if the same technology is going to apply to your communities, that will not be an option for you. Because Nantucket and the Vineyard are islands. There, we could release enough mice that are heritably immunized, that is, they would encode in their genomes native mouse antibodies, products of the mouse immune system, that render them resistant, and they would pass those on to future generations of mice. Any guesses as to how many white-footed mice there probably are on the mainland? Probably a couple billion. So, I think it's seven billion, actually. No. Same as the number of people on Earth. It's a lot of mice. Yeah. So there we would need to use what's called the gene drive system that would spread this resistance, these resistant genes, through the population. And now, the genes required to do that, well, let's just say if you put a mouse, hopefully you already euthanized it, in a blender and blended it up and took out all the DNA, you would find all of the relevant genes in there. But they wouldn't be from the mouse. They would be from the bacteria in its gut. And mind you, the mouse doesn't work without the bacteria in its gut. So depending on your conception of what a mouse is, that may or may not <laughs> cut the mustard when it comes to, does this all come from a mouse or not? OK, conceptions but, of mouse, that's, the, that's another day. Right. But the upshot is people are interested. And, they, and so long as they are in control, so long as they feel that they have a voice, that they are guiding the technology rather than having technology force choices on them, then they're very interested. But I, one final thing. This only works because these are fairly small yeah, communities. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is a really exciting experiment, but if it wasn't a small, prosperous, cohesive group of people, I don't know that you could even consider doing it. And what we're talking about are tremendous changes to humans, to the environment. How do you guys think we even communicate those things or communicate the possibility that we should have that conversation? Because I don't even think we're there yet. So I'll jump in. Um, I, I, let me respond to that with two things. I'm going to come back to your democratic deliberation model with the second one. Um, first, as a way at getting at your question about how do we communicate it, um, let me start by asking a question of the people here. So we, we had a, a conversation for the last half hour before this one where we talked a lot about editing gene editing. How many of you know the difference between germline and somatic genetics? Right. And who on the stage, despite the fact that there was a 30-minute conversation about germline editing, explained what that word meant? No one. And I really care about the three people who were here before. I like them. I think incredibly well of them. But the it's first- It's my fault. I'm supposed it's to not, do the it's not, a, it's not even necessarily your fault. Necessarily. It is. Okay. Necessarily. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take some of the responsibility because you were on stage <laughs> then too. But 
I, you know, so one of the biggest problems in conversations about science, one of the things I really like about what you just did is you explain things in really simple terms, even grotesque ones like a blender um, <laughs> of a mouse, but in ways that were accessible and understandable. There was very little jargon. I counted maybe three words that you said that were jargony, and I think most of them were words that people here would understand, like pathogen or things like that. You even explained what gene drive meant. That's great, right? But the only way we're gonna get to a part of the conversation where there is the second thing, democratic deliberation, where I'm gonna get to is if we train our scientists starting at the earliest level to be able to communicate their science in a much more accessible way. Okay, so, but now you have to define the difference between germline and somatic I agree, except even if it wasn't my panel, we haven't talked about it yet. If I was talking about germline to begin with, I would have. So the difference that we were talking about in the last panel, the difference, uh, the kind of controversy comes with do you change things in the genome that can be passed on to future generations, right? So it's in the egg, it's in the sperm, it's in the embryo from the get-go, which means that future generations can inherit that same genome. That's germline, okay? Versus somatic, which is if, if we change something in me that just gets expressed in my body and doesn't get passed on to my children, that's a somatic change. That's far less scary to a lot of people because it doesn't implicate future generations. And it's also more the like the way drugs work. It's much more the way drugs work. It's just a change in your body versus a change in what we call your gametes, right? Your egg and your sperm that can be passed on to future generation or the embryo that is expressing it in every single one of its cells that is, as, that is replicating as it is dividing from the earliest stages. So understanding that's really important to the conversation about whether or not we should do germline editing. Don't you all agree? Yeah, yeah right? So. You know, I, I launched something at Duke called the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, and, and the whole idea of it is to try to figure out how to bring science to society and how to bring society to science. And the first core program that we launched in that is our SciCom program. It's a science communication training program that trains scientists to be able to talk about their science in ways that are accessible. And we start with like SciCom fellows. We take faculty members who are doing really exciting, interesting research and ask them to give a two-minute description of what they do. And it's mind-numbing at first, it really is. I mean, my eyes glaze over, even though I really love science. And it's because they can't explain it in a way that's accessible and interesting and makes any sense to the rest of us who don't do their science. And so we work with them, starting there, on how do you actually explain what you do in a way that is relevant, accessible, and interesting to other people. So I think that's the beginning part of the conversation is training scientists and training the rest of us who are non-scientists to understand the science as well, right? We've got to bring education up from both angles. The second, then, is this wonderful process of democratic deliberation that you described, right? Which is once we have everybody starting to talk the same language, figuring out a way for conversations to occur so that the public is invested in the science and is able to drive the science. And that works for an application, but it doesn't necessarily work for basic science because you can't go with basic science to the public and say, I have no idea what we're gonna be able to do with this 15, 20 years from now, five years from now. I have no idea what the application of it's gonna be. Will you invest in it? Because mere knowledge is really good because there are all these promises in the future. So it's harder to have a model of democratic deliberation when you're not talking about a practical application for a community. It's much easier and I think a wonderful model, if everybody is talking about science the way you did, to bring people together to make important decisions. So, those are my two points. Wanda? Yeah. Oops, Thanks. lots of applause there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wanna talk over that. So, I, I would offer two examples about two indigenous communities as a way to think about the responsibility of scientists and about the healthy skepticism that some communities, I think, rightly have about um, changes in genetic technologies and other sorts of scientific developments. One story, uh, these might be stories you both know, is about the Havasupai people who uh, live in the Grand Canyon. In 1998, um, they create, uh, through consultation, an arrangement with scientists at Arizona State University to do a research project on diabetes. Um, by 2004, uh, members of this community are suing the scientific researchers in ASU because they are, um, had promised to do research on diabetes, but were doing genetic analysis for other things, um, things that the community did not agree to. By 2010, the project is shut down. Um, there's a settlement to the community, a settled men and funds, and the genetic information is returned to the community. 
The second example is more recent. Um, is the San community in South Africa, um, which uh, earlier this year in March um, required researchers to abide by their code of ethics, their code of research, re uh, research ethics that they created as an indigenous community in order to work with them and partner with them to do research. So I think that what I want to offer here is that we need to, with the first example, admit that scientists have really messed up, right? Um, that there have been instances in which um, people have, you know, scientific researchers have not done the right thing or have not fulfilled their ethical responsibility to the communities that they work with. Um, and these are not, uh, to go back to, to Hank's phrase, the mad scientists of Faustus or Frankenstein and the like, um, but these are sometimes people's first engagements with scientific research. Um, and if they turn out to be not reasonable um, or respectful engagements, they really shape our ability to have what I think is a model deliberative process that you're having, a process of consultation, right? Um, as Michael pointed out, the process of consultation that you, um, that you describe um, on the vineyard in Nantucket are deeply um, uh, elite communities. Um, one is right, you know, wood, wood, you go through Woods Hole in order to get to the vineyard, so there are communities that are deeply knowledgeable about science in a, in a very particular way. And so, you know, the question I think remains for us, you know, how do we, I think, both replicate a model like that in communities that are, there's a, there's a much more sort of unevenness or inequality between the knowledge and power that the researchers have and those that the research subjects might have, so it's on the one hand, um, and um, you know, how do we do that in a way that values the experiences of, that the people bring to bear um, in these conversations and are respectful of those? So I think we have a long way to go, and I think, but I do think that this model is a model one, and what if it was the norm of science? That would be a, a magnificent thing, and I'm, I'm so glad that um, you clearly sort of take it as a first order issue about how you do your work. But I also think it's the answer for us. I mean, um, you know, Michael, you were suggesting that what do we do? It's small community. It's an isolated community. I do think we might imagine um, scaling that up from small communities to nation states to sort of bigger entities. And um, I would hope that we would at least try. Well, one of the things, I was in Mali because I'm working on a book on these things. And there's a group called Target Malaria. And they have edited mosquitoes in London that are not able to transmit malaria. They are going to spend quite a bit of time and a lot of money talking to people in Mali, in Burkina Faso, Uganda, before they ever consider releasing those mosquitoes. And actually, they, wouldn't, they would scream if they heard me say that, because they're not going to release them. They're going to give those people the opportunity to decide whether they want to do that, and the information that they hope they need to make those decisions. And I think this is, um, I mean, Kevin has said this a lot and written it, and I think it's true. This sort of revolutionary framing of how we deal with our physical world is also a revolutionary opportunity to change the focus of science mm -hmm. and make it more about participation. Because, listen, for a living, I deal with scientists. And I love them. But some of them don't speak any known language. And <laughs> it's my job. I'm paid to translate. It's fine. That's what I do. But it, it would be helpful if people could communicate their excitement in some way. Because people are normal human beings. They'll get excited if there's something they get excited about. But your eyes can just glaze over so rapidly on the most exciting research that's going on in the world. Some of these Cas9 CRISPR studies that are earth shattering, I look at them and I want to weep. But it takes me like nine times to read them before I even figure out why they're earth shattered, or else I just call Kevin or Drew and they tell me. But <laughs> you know, we have a really long way to go. And I guess my concern is that not that many people seem to think we need to go there. To go to editing? No, to go to, <laughs> no, to, go to communicating about whatever we want to do in a community. Well, I mean, part of it is if you go back to the surveys to begin with, right? I mean, so instead of looking at those surveys and saying, you know what, we have this giant gap in understanding. Um, what people instead say is the public is ignorant and not worth consulting with, mm -hmm. um, or that they're politically motivated and you know you can't ever possibly like take climate science right take the rhetoric around climate science where instead of you know recognizing that maybe there's been some inadequacy in the way that some of the science has been um, delivered and communicated, it's the fault of the public for their ignorance and political ideology and motivation, and I think that creates this 
artificial divide yep. between scientists and the public, um, and a maligning of the public as if they are irrelevant, even though, right, I mean, we're all invested in what our world looks like, and we all have a right to be invested in what our world looks like. Do you think it is either um, helpful or maybe utopian to think about changing the basic educational structure of our schools? Because wow. kids don't get any of this. And I personally would love to see kids in third grade editing worms. Well, but I think you have to, right, you have to start by personalizing and making science accessible from the youngest age, right? Abstract concepts as the way we teach science to younger generations makes it not necessarily that interesting and engaging. Mm -hmm. yep. And so, yeah, I mean, if they're able to edit a worm, that's great. Um, we also need to teach them the bioethics of editing a worm or any other part of the world so that, to Drew's point, we're really partnering with you know, the nature and the environment rather than editing nature and the environment. And so I think, absolutely, we need to fundamentally change education from the youngest level, and we need to rethink how we teach science, how people understand science, how we communicate science, how we integrate science, education from the get-go, I think. Can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I would just offer, I mean, there's one experiment happening, right, which is our precision medicine, all of us enrollment strategies, right, which are trying to have a million people, a million genotypes, um, uh, sort of in a database to do big science research. So this is an experiment in which you have to explain to people why they should participate in this. And particularly because we're trying to create databases that are more diverse in the sense of human variation, right? Mm -hmm. And that means we're um, you know, beginning to need to enroll people um, into an imagination of clinical research who might not have participated before. Mm -hmm. So there is already a kind of social experiment happening in how you talk to people about you know, what are the stakes of uh, new gene technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think, a relationship being created or questions being asked and answered at least about what happens to the information that you gather from people. What information do you have to get back to them? How often do you have to go back to them? If you, if you find something in the genome, what do you have to tell them? Um, and so, you know, who knows what will happen with all of us, but it's certainly a space um, where these conversations are being, are being played out right now. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be a little provocative because we're agreeing with each other far too much. So Christina, I, come I don't think so. So I, I <laughs> often believe that, so I work on gene drive, which is a way of causing a genetic trait to spread through an entire wild population. And the challenge that their target malaria faces in Africa is they're using the basic form, which spreads to the in all members of the species, if you do it right. And that's hard, because these Anopheles mosquitoes that spread malaria in Africa are present in more than 20 countries, harboring hundreds of millions of people at a minimum. So how are you going to get them all to agree? Because you need wide dispersal. You need to release the engineered mosquitoes. It will spread on its own, but slowly. So if you want to impact malaria, you need every one of those countries to agree to let you release mosquitoes in an even pattern over throughout the country. If you just decide to say, no, there's too many kids dying, and one country doesn't have the right to veto this, when the other countries want to go through, well, you're probably, first of all, you're setting a terrible precedent. You're saying we're going to unilaterally engineer the environment. But you're also, they're not going to let you do it thereafter. You're probably not going to eradicate malaria. And that's why this is such a hard problem. The smaller scale you go, the easier it is. And so we have to figure out some way of starting small and building up. Mm -hmm. And I think that means we need to cherry pick it. We need to get, bluntly, we need to get the powerful and well-educated to volunteer themselves and their communities as guinea pigs. And scientists, in turn, need to do things completely differently. Because when you're talking about a technology like this or about geoengineering, this is something where even beginning to do the work in the laboratory means you are making a decision that could affect people outside the laboratory. And if you do that work behind closed doors, and make no mistake, virtually all of science is kept secret from everybody until the moment of publication. Because the incentive system is set up such that if you tell somebody else your genius idea, some other lab is going to go off and do it, rush it, publish first, they get all the credit, you get none. This is an insane way to set up your scientific system. No one in their right mind building it from scratch would say we should do it this way. And yet we do, because that's the way it al we have always done it. It never worked great even before the cost of sharing information went to zero. But if you want to engage with a community, how can you do that if you're only telling them what the technology is when you've already gotten it working? Then it's too late. Then you're going to the FDA for regulatory approval. You get the public comment period. But no matter what people say, you can't do anything. It's too late. Done. Finished product. So this elite model is not going to work, actually. So I'm going to offer a case, the case study of 23andMe, which is um, in its early days, 
um, you know, $1,000, tests are expensive, the price has gone down significantly in the decade it's been in business. Um, but almost all of the consumers are Ashkenazi Jews, right? So when you have an iterative research process in which you are iterating these people's samples into your database to give it, your reference database to give it more power, and it's over-determined by Ashkenazi Jews, that, you know, the, that's your elite sample, right, potentially, right? The people who were the early adopters who could afford to pay the high prices or went to the elite part, the spit parties, because um, they had fancy networks and these sorts of things. Um, but we know now for 23andMe that by 2011, um, they had to start a Roots for Real program in which they were giving away free tests to African Americans to diversify the database. And we know that in the last month, they just started a new program to do something quite similar, to diversify the database. And so it's, you know, here, this is an example of where in which the elites can't lead because unlike mm -hmm. mice, you need a different kind of buy-in from lots of different people when you're doing big genetic science that operates in a different sort of way. But I would again, I mean, it's, it's super early days, but I think this target malaria approach acknowledges that problem. Yeah, fair and, enough. And I have to say that, and again, it's anecdotal, there are not millions of people that I talk to, but I talk to a bunch of people in Africa who are really opposed to genetically modified food products who cannot wait to get gene edited mosquitoes flying around. And there's this pretty simple reason, I think, because very few people wake up in the morning and say, oh my god, I'm so excited about GMO corn. <laughs> but the idea, but everybody in Mali has either had malaria, knows, has had a kid die of it. No, it's impossible not to be affected. So the idea that you could say, this is a possible way of solving your problem. Same with like, I was blown away when Kevin first went to Nantucket, because I thought he was going to encounter a lot of opposition, and partly because he presented it so openly. But also, they have a stake in what the future is. And, and, and I naturally think any of the things we've discussed about with gene editing, particularly um, embryonic germline, germline, um, <laughs> those things have to be discussed by society it's so, just that I worry that we're not going to be able to, to resolve these issues, and then some people are going to do it and some people aren't. So, so I worry about a slightly different thing. I think with the malaria case, you can get people interested because it directly affects them. Um, but there aren't that many uh, scientific research programs that have that kind of impact and that kind of relevance to people. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of different attempts at grassroots and local democratic deliberation about different scientific advances that have been tried where nobody comes, nobody shows up, right? I mean, so this room holds how many people? Right, and there's maybe 100 here, right? And I don't know where everybody else is. They're probably on the Rio Grande Trail or something, but, um, you know, it, it is, this is, I think, one of the most important issues that is facing people today, um, and yet, there aren't that many people for even something incredibly super relevant that could touch their lives that show up to talk about it. And so I, I think when you have a captive audience about um, you know, what are you gonna do with the genetically engineered mice on Nantucket, that's wonderful that you can get them engaged. Um, the, I think part of the reason why people are willing to talk about CRISPR-Cas9 is because of the editing of embryos. Um, as the way that the media has largely presented what the kind of major implications are, even though there's a million other potential applications that are probably more immediate and more impactful that are going to happen. Um, and so I think part of it is figuring out how to get people to care to come to the table and actually have the conversation. So I may be, I am probably overly optimistic as a human being, but it's occurred to me that if things work well on Nantucket and things work well with malaria, Having two fantastic examples of this kind of science make giant changes would actually move the needle in places where the needle never moves. Okay, so it moves the needle with respect to the re environmental release of some genetically engineered no, but I mean, organism, I think but it not might for a lot people... of the other earlier conversations that need to be had, sure, but and I a lot just... of the democratic deliberation that you would hope to have. But I think there's often a, a sort of People go into this with a closed mind, and I think they could go into it with less of a closed mind if they had some knowledge of an experience that was broadly positive. Well, so that, I mean, and another way of saying that is one of the things that we do a really bad job of, and I think you did a really nice job, so even though I criticized the germline, I'm gonna give you a little kudos otherwise, which is to start with what the benefits are. 
right? So what, you know, what's the upside? We do a good job, um, you know, for me from the kind of bioethics community, uh, we focus a lot on what are the potential risks, right? What are the unintended consequences? Um, and if you start the conversation there, at this point, a lot of people are scared about misuse of genetics. Well, but they don't necessarily know what the promise of genetics is. Okay, right? I agree, and thank you for the compliment, but the word necess <laughs> not necessarily remains in my mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I think that's why I wanted in, the second, in that previous conversation to not just talk about unintended consequences, but to talk about intended consequences, right. to talk about flourishing, because let's not lose sight of the fact that this technology, in theory, has the ability to do some really wonderful things. And also, by the way, like looking at the malaria thing, one of the things it has the possibility of doing is doing it at a tremendously low cost. Right. People wouldn't have to go to clinics and have vaccines and get clean water, and they wouldn't have to stop working. They just get to be bitten by non-malarial mosquitoes. Right, so, so those examples of successes, when you come to a community with, look, here's a couple of examples of wonderful applications. Here's some other potential extraordinary applications. Um, and then here are some of the risks, right? And, and the kind of Here's even the most remote risk, but, but framing it, I think, can help a lot with the conversation. And openness is key. Yeah, and I think this absolutely. is, I think it's important to have these kinds of flagship examples, because not only does that sort of set an example for how future projects should be done, even if they're not going to have the effects of eradicating malaria, you need to invite people to participate. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily need them to understand everything. In fact, in most cases, you definitely don't. The reason why we are transparent is because it's twofold. One, the people who live in an environment know more about it than we do. To s assume that you have to have a PhD in order to be able to contribute is, I don't even have words for this. There is no scientific method. I don't, I don't think there is any such thing. I think that science happens when you encourage people to question you, to try to prove you wrong. It's to invite others to say, I'm, I think this is the way it is, but I'm not positive. Help me figure out if I'm wrong. And okay. if you set the system up that way, it can work. And there's no reason to restrict that to professional scientists. Okay, let me be the like right-wing goon here. <laughs> Is there no role for expertise? Of course there's a role for expertise. You need, you need the technical hands to actually do the complicated work in the lab. But there is also something to be said for local expertise. There's different yeah. forms of expertise. If anything, sure. our culture overvalues the technical expertise in the lab. But, I, but the point is, we don't know where a crucial insight might come from. And the downside of expertise is what we call the curse of knowledge. It's hard to unlearn that jargon when you're talking to a general audience. Yep. It's incredibly difficult to explain your fundamental assumption. If I were to explain my assessment of where the next 50 years are just now without explaining that, most of you would think I'm a total raving loony because there's so many inferential steps that are necessary that I assume that Drew's exponentially decre decrease in the cost of different technologies that will then have cascading effects with this thing and that field and so on. But m I can do that because I specialize in scientific fields that don't exist yet. It's also important not to go there until you go in the middle places because people can't. I don't but think that's true. I mean, mm. so I spent, I've written two monographs on basic, on effectively the public understanding of genetics. Um, and, and, and what both of them suggest is that people have very complicated feelings about genetics and that they can live in a place of, um, of complexity and a place of nuance and a place where of paradox and thinking about genetics and that actually it's okay. And these aren't scientific or technical experts, yeah. um, but there are people who can understand paradoxical stories. One, it can be a story of you know, extraction of resources from a community and abuse, and one can be a story that's deeply empowering and that can you know, lead to the cessation of malaria in a community. And those things can exist side by side. And, um, you know, and I think that we need to, the openness needs to not only be to the communities, but to the fact that this is possible. Right? There's a kind of um, paternalism in a thinking that people can't hold these kind of complex that things in their minds who are not expert, experts, yeah. right? Um, that's important. Can I interrupt? We're done with the normal part of it, and now we have time for people to ask questions. And I would just ask if you want, the, everyone who's spoken is wired. You can ask anyone. You just don't have to ask us things. Um, stand up. So there are people with mics. Stand up when you're going to ask a question, and um, then ask it. Why don't you guys come up? My name is Bob Taylor, and I'm from San Francisco. 
uh, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion of a very complicated societal problem that cuts across more than just the field of genetics. Uh, one of the things that we've heard a great deal about in the news lately is false or fake news. Uh, and, and science lends itself to fake news. The term for those of us who spent time in courtrooms uh, trying to get science across to a judge or jury, uh, call it junk science. And each side will have an incentive to deliver junk science. Uh, you haven't, no one's talked about that, but it's a very important part of this discussion, it seems to me. Yeah. I, I'm gonna jump for one second on that, which is Please one do. of the things that um, you were talking about earlier was the incentive system and how broken the scientific incentive system is, not only because it leaves people behind closed doors, but also because there are incentives for scientists to sensationalize their science. Um, and in order to sell stories, of course, there's incentives for the media to sensationalize the science. Um, and so that's not quite fake news, right? It's not quite um, not true, but it is an exaggeration of what the science can do, um, oftentimes by leaps and bounds. And part of the incentive structure that is set up to do that is, um, for example, the, the grants, the way that you would get a grant, you have to really be able to um, show that there is uh, an enormous significance to the work that you're doing. And so that leads to some of this kind of sensationalization. So I think part of it is we have to get at the incentive system. We have to figure out a way to um, have science be more open, to have as part of a kind of code of conduct within science uh, the idea that there shouldn't be sensationalization, that there does need to be some way to actually communicate science more effectively. And then there needs to be more of the types of things that are Prop, that are popping up, um, like factcheck.org, there's brainfacts.org, and um, other types of organizations that are dedicated to actually trying to debunk some of those sciences, uh, some of those scientific things. And I think that kind of a system, those fact checks, really are helpful to be able to go and find out what's true, what isn't, what are the real risks, what are the real benefits. Other questions? Yeah. Oh. Can I jump in a little? So, so. Uh, Jeff, going from what you said about how like it's not our fault that people believe that uh, intelligence is <laughs> genetically determined or not, uh, I offer an anecdote from after your panel this morning. Uh, as I was walking out of uh, whatever the other room, there was a guy just holding forth, like telling this young woman, uh, in five years, they're going to be able to print out whole human genomes with all of the characteristics defined. Nobody said that this morning. But somebody, <laughs> that's what they took from it. And, and so. What can I do about that? I think that. Uh, I mean, we were very clear. You are not very clear that that's not possible. Drew gave the, the <laughs> calculus of 19 years. Um, there was no one on that stage who said, oh yeah, we'll be printing out genomes and making uh, artificial humans in five years. So the five years maybe was the, like, where, where he took it, but you okay. Is it gonna happen? Yeah. Are you, if, are you nitpicking me about five years versus 19 years? Yeah. <laughs> then then yeah. that's like, that's I mean, if you're asking is. me, is that gonna be possible? Yeah. It's yeah. totally gonna be well, possible. What I'm, what I'm saying is, like, as Nita said, there is a lot of potential for sensationalization, and that, that there is a, a spark of it that does happen in the kinds of things that we are saying on stages like this and in the media. What and if then, the things we say that are sensational are also <laughs> real? Should we, should we not? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Christina. I don't want to. Well, uh, I was just saying that there's also a lot. Like these are also stories that spread on their own and have their own their own lifetime. Um, and as and so, thinking about how these stories are part of our social milieu, <laughs> and and how they are important uh, is also part of it too. So we, we are telling these stories within a context that people live in. So I think what Alondra is saying about people have all these ideas about genetics and they can be quite nuanced and quite complex without a lot of technical knowledge. Like that, that when we are starting to say things, they fall into that. And it's not, it's not that it's fake, it's that there's, some of it is kind, it can be imagination, <laughs> imaginary. Anyway, that's what I want to say. Okay. Um, Bruce McGower, I'm wondering, uh, with endangered species, can you clone those? Can you Begin, can you begin to, are we going to let evolution take its role, or are we going to try to do something about that? Yeah. Hank? Let me uh, take a shot at that. There's a lot of interest right now in using genetic tools both to preserve and protect and increase endangered species, and sometimes 
There's even discussion about bringing back species that have already gone extinct. So the de-extinction, conservation biology, there's a very tricky controversial interplay between the two. But the tools of genetics clearly can be used to try to help preserve some endangered species, sometimes through cloning, sometimes through adding genetic diversity that has disappeared, sometimes by bringing back species that are gone. If you're interested in this at all, there's a foundation called Revive and Restore, run by Stuart Brand and Ryan Phelan. Uh, their website is a font of information about both the conservation biology and the de-extinction possibilities of these technologies. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, for the current panel, a question on uh, public acceptance of gene editing. Um, at least in my uh, understanding, the current uh, immunotherapy that's being used for cancer treatments and that is a form of gene editing. And the way that came to the fore was more or less, uh, uh, it wasn't well publicized before people started doing it, but just that they did it with certain people who had the chance of being cured by immunotherapies. And now it's out in the public that immunotherapy is something that works and it seems to be accepted. Isn't this a direction that future gene editing type things can happen or can, can use the same? Again, I think you're the, getting back to this distinction between germline editing, which is no, making heritable changes in, in organisms and editing the cells of individuals. And I think editing the cells of individuals, anything that can happen there that happens properly, it's pretty easy to analogize it to being like a drug. And drugs are accepted. You can go to someone who's with terminal cancer and say, you're probably going to die in six months, and I have this super risky gene editing thing that I'd like to try. And it might kill you tonight, but it might also save you. And then they, can, they have the ability to have an informed decision. But you don't. That is a completely different thing than a germline. It could. I mean, so, so that's the kind of thing. I think more likely than really complex uh, behavioral traits like intelligence, more likely what at least the initial applications for germline gene editing would be would be for something like BRCA or um, APOE4, which, are, you know, which contributes to uh, Alzheimer's disease, um, or, or Tay-Sachs, right? I mean, these are the types of things where you, you could imagine you might have gene editing at an early stage, at the germline stage, in the creation of an embryo, um, that would prevent the manifestation of that disease later. And I think it'll usually be simple. I mean, it'll it'll start with much simpler traits, much simpler um, in terms of the number of genes involved that you could make edits to. And I think it would start with health. And of course, that opens up a huge amount of controversy because, to Christina's point, um, what do we think of as healthy, and what do we think of as not healthy can shift over time, and there are plenty of people uh, who are disability advocates who wouldn't want us to think about what they have as something that should be edited out of the genome for future populations. True. We're out of time. Um, thank you for coming. I know we solved all your problems. Let me just say that it would be nice if people who came here today thought about these things and talked to their friends about them. It doesn't even matter. There are no sides. But if, if you could just get a conversation going somewhere, it couldn't be bad, and we need a lot of those. So thank you. <laughs>